Well, hello and welcome to the very first in a new digital series of Cambridge Conversations. Here with me, Chris Smith. I'm the naked scientist and I'm very sorry if anyone's now sorely disappointed they're expecting a display of nudity. I can reassure you, though, if I was genuinely naked, you'd be a lot more disappointed than you're now feeling. A very warm welcome to more than 1,500 people around the world who are joining us from 69 countries for this discussion concerning this entity, which has seen about a quarter of the world's population locked down and confined to their home and millions of people potentially infected and tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of people succumbing. We have today two authorities who are helping to fight back against COVID, and they're going to explain to you what Cambridge University is doing to fight COVID. They are Nick Matheson, who is an infectious diseases consultant at the University of Cambridge, formerly of Trinity College, and Ken Smith, no relationship to me, there's not many of us though, and he is originally from Australia, he's Professor of Medicine at the University of Cambridge and the Director of Studies for Clinical Medicine at Pembroke College. They'll each have eight minutes to outline their role in the fight against COVID at the University of Cambridge, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for you to ask questions. If you want to put a question in, and we have some coming in already, can I ask several things? One, can you please keep your questions really short and succinct so we can easily understand them? That's important, and I can also read them out. But also, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a point there which is where you click to ask a question. They'll be fed to a moderating team who will then send those questions through to me, and I will then pass them on to Ken and Nick once they've had a chance to tell you about their work and their contribution. Nick's going to go first and Ken is going to follow up. So Nick, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, so I think it's really my job to set the scene and describe the scope and scale of the problem. I'd like to use my next slide to remind everyone how quickly the world has changed. So the first cases of COVID-19 were, of course, reported to the World Health Organization or WHO on December 31st, 2019, my birthday, in fact. These were linked to the wet market in Wuhan City in China. Of course, we didn't call the disease COVID-19 at that point or know the causative agent. Within a week, however, a novel coronavirus was identified and its genetic sequence determined. On February 11th, this virus was named SARS-CoV-2, that's Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, and the disease it causes was determined as COVID-19. That's coronavirus disease arising in 2019. Now, it's a tradition in Western medicine to learn at the bedside from patients. In normal times, we present patients, termed cases, at a weekly meeting for everyone in the hospital called a grand round. I thought I'd try the same sort of thing today. I'm therefore going to start by describing two cases the first of which is summarised on my next slide. This case is in fact based around the very first patient we saw in Cambridge with COVID-19. He was a 56-year-old man who ran his own business with his sons. He presented in early March with fever, fever, fatigue and shortness of breath after a trip to London. He was normally fit and well, a non-smoker with no regular medications. He did, however, have a significantly abnormal chest X-ray, as shown on the right. For comparison, a normal chest X-ray is shown above, where the black areas represent air in the lungs. In the patient's chest X-ray, by contrast, the patchy white changes represent infection. Moving to the next slide, you'll see that this patient did in fact do well. He required support with oxygen therapy, but was discharged home after a week. The second patient, shown on my next slide, was unfortunately not so lucky, or at least not so far. He was a 69-year-old retired man who acquired COVID-19 in the community in Cambridge. He presented with similar symptoms, fever, shortness of breath and cough. By contrast with the first patient, however, he had a significant medical history, including high blood pressure and ischemic heart disease. That's a previous heart attack. He was more unwell and therefore underwent a CT scan as shown on the right. Again, for comparison, a normal CT is shown above. These scans effectively represent cross sections through the patient's body. 
As with the previous chest X-ray, the black air spaces have been replaced by patchy white changes representing infection. Moving to the next slide, you'll see that this patient has had a more complicated course in hospital. In fact, he's been moved to the intensive care unit and placed on a ventilator to help him breathe. And he remains there after more than two weeks. The severity of disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 can therefore vary considerably as illustrated by these two patients and as shown on my next slide. Now, the patients I described both had severe COVID-19, that is, they required hospital admission, and the condition of the second patient is still critical. Of course, the majority of patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 do develop mild disease, and many patients are likely to remain completely asymptomatic. Overall, current estimates suggest that around 1% of infected patients ultimately perish, but many more require hospitalisation. And as with the patients I've described, severe disease is much commoner in older men who either smoke or who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease. The consequences of this for our hospital in Cambridge are shown on my next slide. As of a couple of days ago, we've treated 294 patients with COVID-19, of almost, including almost 70 who have required intensive care. We've so far successfully discharged around 100, but unfortunately more than 30 have died. The upshot is that more than 10% of our hospital beds are occupied by patients with COVID-19. And this includes around 40 patients on the intensive care unit. I should point out our intensive care unit is normally able to treat only 30 patients altogether. Of course, some parts of the UK have been even worse affected, as illustrated by my next slide. Most cases have been focused on London and the major conurbations in the Midlands and the north of England. And this has caused major issues, in particular for intensive care capacity. On the plus side, because of the isolation and social distancing measures put in place by the government around March 23rd, that is so-called lockdown, the number of new reported cases has plateaued over the last few days. This overall picture is mirrored in many countries around the world, as shown in my next slide. What started as an outbreak in Wuhan city in China has over the last few weeks become a truly global problem. Europe and North America have been severely affected, whereas so far Africa and South America have been relatively spared. They are clearly, however, at extremely high risk. So where do we go from here? I'd like to finish by showing a couple of my possibilities on my next slide. These are rather complicated figures from two serious mathematical modelling papers. The one on the left is from Neil Ferguson's group at Imperial, the one on the right from Harvard. The point is the wavy lines appearing on both are projections of COVID-19 case numbers over the next couple of years. And the regions highlighted in blue represent extended repetitive periods of lockdown required to keep these numbers manageable. The message is SARS-CoV-2 will almost inevitably recrudesce when lockdown measures are lifted. And in the absence of an effective treatment or vaccine, further prolonged and very damaging periods of lockdown will be required to prevent loss of life. I'm going to end on that rather sobering note and have summarised my conclusions on the next slide. Unlike some reports or statements to the press, COVID-19 is clearly more severe than seasonal flu. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed unprecedented strain on health services locally and around the world. It is unfortunately not going to go away anytime soon. And there is no acceptable exit strategy, which does not depend on research and development. So having described the scope and scale of the challenge, I'll now hand over to Ken to describe how we're addressing it in Cambridge. Thanks, Nick. Uh, before heading off to tell you about the Cambridge strategy for dealing with COVID-19, uh, I'd like to give you some geographic perspective on the first slide. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, so those of you who were around in 1963, which was my birth date, uh, in the top, will notice in the top left-hand corner a picture of what was then the Cambridge Biomedical Campus, which had only two buildings on it, uh, one research building and one early hospital building. Uh, 
-hmm. The main I chose the current Cambridge Biomedical Campus, which is the largest such organization in, in Europe. You can see it focused around Addenbrooke's Hospital, uh, the Rosie, and more recently the Royal Papworth Hospital. Integrated within them and spread across the campus are a range of research institutes, predominantly run by the university, but also with important contributions from industry. So that's the current uh, focus of strategy that I'm going to talk to you about. When COVID-19 struck, the hospital, as Nick has pointed out, had to reorganize itself quite dramatically, dramatically to deal with an increased and changed caseload. What the university was forced to do when the lockdown was imposed was to stop most of its research activity across the campus. What continued was focused on a single building outlined with the arrow in the center and pictured on my next slide. Uh, this is the Cambridge Institute for Therapeutic Immunology and Infectious Disease, uh, which is established in the Geoffrey Cheer Biomedical Center. This institute only opened in October, and it was designed to focus on the interface between the human immune system and pathogens. In other words, to study exactly the sort of problem posed by COVID-19. Over the year before this opened, we developed a strategy for increasing our links with people around the world so that we had a global network to help us fight these various problems. And as part of building this new institute, we created the largest academic containment level three facility in the United Kingdom. And that's shown in the bottom left. This is essentially a high security set of laboratories designed to allow us to safely research dangerous pathogens such as coronavirus. So we have all the infrastructure in place to deal with this problem. What we then did was to refocus all of the research work going on in the Institute onto COVID-19. That's over 150 scientists now focused on this specific problem. We decided to take an approach that integrated us very closely with the NHS, as, it, as is illustrated on my next slide, because we thought that it was important that our research benefited patients in the short term, as well as providing important research information. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of examples of that. The first is shown here, uh, and that is the staff testing at Addenbrooke's Hospital. We noticed a few weeks ago that it was going to be impossible to ramp up the hospital's testing capacity sufficiently to enable them to test patients as well as staff. So Mike Weeks, one of the academic infectious diseases physicians, arranged the logistics for staff screening within the university. And what he, you can see some rather makeshift looking pods in the figure there. They pro today will process 100 staff members uh, to test for COVID-19. The samples that are produced from the swabs there will then be transported to the university laboratories in Sitted uh, and tested with a turnaround time of about 24 hours. That allows us to test patients, uh, sorry, or to test staff who are symptomatic at home, but also asymptomatic ward staff on high risk in high risk areas of the hospital. It enables us to tell people who are infected that they should go home, but also to tell those who are not infected that they're safe to return to work. In both cases, reducing the spread of infection between staff members and to our patients. The next slide shows another example of where we've made a direct contribution to testing. This one uh, is a study being carried out by Helen Lee and Ravi Gupta, which has introduced the first point of care COVID-19 test into clinical practice in the UK. You can see four machines there, Samba 2 machines developed by Helen, uh, and they allow point of care testing with a turnaround <clears throat> of half hours uh, compared to the 24 to 48 hours of standard testing. So these machines are available to patients as they come into our COVID admissions ward uh, and are making an enormous impact on clinical practice. In addition to that, of course, by validating this new test, we should be able to help it roll out into the NHS in the coming weeks. So we're trying to integrate our research approach with the NHS to provide early direct patient benefit. But we're also studying patients, as the next slide shows, uh, to try and understand disease in a way that allows us to prioritize early treatment interventions. If you look at the middle panel here, it shows our current idea of how the response to this virus takes place. You can see on the left an early viral response phase, which is where the viral, uh, where the human immune system responds to the virus and tries to clear it. And of course, in most patients, this is successful. Patients have very mild symptoms and get better. But in a subset of patients, as Nick pointed out, there's an ongoing and increasing inflammatory response which then starts to damage the lungs and other organs and cause the disease that puts people into intensive care and puts them at risk of death. So 
we and others are very keen to understand the differences between these two phases of the response to the virus, and in particular the pathways that are important in the late inflammatory phase that causes all the damage. We're doing that by comparing with detailed analyses samples taken from patients with very mild disease, which at the top you'll see are taken from our staff screening program that I've just described, and patients with very severe disease, those admitted to Addenbrooke's Hospital. And already we're seeing striking differences between the immune response in those two patient subgroups that are allowing us to think about ways of deploying currently available anti-inflammatory and therapy, anti-inflammatory therapies to treat severe disease. As well as doing things that we think will have an impact in the relatively short term, the next slide shows one example of the ex experimental program that we're putting together to try and make a long-term difference. As Nick pointed out, we need a definitive e exit strategy from this virus, and that will come either with a vaccine or with antivirals that can control infection. So I'm just going to give you one example of many uh, programs that are now underway to try and provide this long-term response to the virus. This one from Paul Lehner. What Paul's trying to do is to understand why some coronaviruses, for example, the one on the right, can infect human cells through this ACE2 receptor uh, and cause very mild disease akin to the common cold. Whereas the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters through exactly the same receptor and therefore it infects exactly the same cells, but has a very different impact that can lead to severe disease and to death. The answer to why these two viruses behave differently is very likely to be found in the proteins that the viruses themselves make and the interactions those proteins have with the immune system. So Paul's group are using proteomic techniques to understand those differences, which should lead to new targets for therapy that take out the most dangerous parts of the SARS-CoV-2 viral response. So let's see the next slide, please. So this is my last data slide. It's blurry and unfortunately it's, it's, it's almost meant to be. This is a list of coronaviruses found in humans and in various animals and their proximity to each other uh, on this dendrogram or tree diagram is an indication of their similarity. So viruses that are next to each other are very s genetically similar and those that are further apart are very genetically diverse. And you'll see right in the middle one highlighted in red and that's the current uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. You can see that it's very close to the SARS virus that was an outbreak a few years ago. It's a long way away from the MERS virus, which is at the top, and from a number of other human coronaviruses, which are boxed in red. In between all of these are huge numbers of coronaviruses found in animals. And of course, these are only the animals we've studied. There'll be many more than this. So what this tells us is that coronaviruses has, have entered Human, the human population many times over the years with varying degrees of severity. But the huge number of coronaviruses out there in different animals and the fact that this is recurring tells us that this is not the last coronavirus pandemic and that this could happen again at any time. It could be much more mild or it could be more severe. So the final part of the Cambridge strategy is to make sure that when we get on top of the current coronavirus, uh, we have a platform in place to allow us to deal with future similar pandemics as they inevitably arise. So I'd just like to summarize what I've just mentioned on the last slide. Uh, our strategy involves investment in the right facilities and the development of a global reach, all of which was in place when this pandemic started. Uh, that's enabled us to rapidly deploy over 150 scientists in a single institute to focus on this disease. Where we work very closely with the NHS and are focused initially on research on patients to provide rapid clinical benefit, but we have a commitment to the longer term science required to deliver a definitive exit strategy. And beyond that, it's very important that we build a Cambridge platform to allow us to deal with future pandemics. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ken, and thank you very much, Nick. Now, just to summarise, there are three of us doing this. Ken and Nick and myself. My actual role at the University of Cambridge is as a consultant virologist. I work at the hospital helping to run the diagnostic lab there. So between the three of us, we're now going to shift the focus on to answering the questions that you have been asking us and sending in. There are quite a few of them. And if we don't get to all of them, we have put in place a way for you to get those questions answered shortly. But at this stage, we would like to acknowledge thank you very much to those people who have been so generous so far with 
philanthropic support for the initiatives that uh, Nick and Ken have outlined, and also with other initiatives such as helping to provide PPE, personal protective equipment for those who are helping to treat patients and are therefore very much at the front line of all of this. So here come the questions. This one, uh, I'm going to start by combining two questions. Nick, this is probably one that is ideal for you. Vishal Kapadia, who's in Germany, and Andrew Hutton in the UK from Maudlin are both interested in the evolution and the mutation of the virus. Vishal says, how can we start to better understand how immunity is evolving in populations? And Andrew says, what's the prospect of the virus mutating? They're both related because obviously if a virus changes, your immunity has to try and keep up too. What's the initiative going to be doing in that respect? Well, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to actually start off by giving a general answer, Chris, and then um, and then actually pass over to Ken in a minute to give another specific part of it. So um, both the questioners are quite right. All viruses vary as they move through populations. Um, this is something I'm used to studying in the context of HIV, which is very variable. Um, SARS-CoV-2 also varies, but much less so than some other viruses. Now, um, it's possible that variations in the virus may lead to differences in how it interacts with patients. The other part of that equation is obviously how the patients themselves differ. And so there are studies focused on both looking at the genetic sequences of the virus and also the genetic sequences of the patients it infects. And that's possibly where Ken's well placed to answer. Yes, yeah, so where Cambridge is involved in driving forward an understanding of that co-evolution of virus and the immune response is in part because along with the Sanger Institute, the Department of Medicine here in Cambridge is driving a national virus sequencing program, which has already sequenced many hundreds of viruses and plans to sequence many thousands. And that will give us an idea over the country of how the virus is evolving and changing. Mapping onto that is a national human genetics study where we where we study the genetics of patients with COVID-19. Uh, that's being run from Edinburgh, but Cambridge is a major contributor to, to that. So we'll end up with a nationwide map of the genetics of both the human immune response and of the virus, which we should be able to put together to start to answer that very important question. Allied to that, uh, Wolf meyer who is in France, is asking, how is virus and treatment information being shared in the medical community across countries? Because you've obviously mentioned the networks locally and nationally. Is intellectual property protection a barrier or an incentive, he's wondering, to rapid development of treatments for COVID-19? Ken. So um, yeah, that's an interesting point. I, at the moment, because this has been so recent and so fast, there's an enormous informal communication between scientists across the world. Um, there's also more recently been the proliferation of open access journals, uh, which take findings without the usual peer review process and just make them public on the web. And they've actually been a mainstay of communication about this epidemic. Um, and it's terrific that they existed. Every day now, people are downloading their early experimental results and, and clinical experience, which is in a way that's actually predominantly very useful, uh, if somewhat overwhelming. In terms of IP, one thing that struck me about the early response to the virus, both here and I think elsewhere, is people aren't worried very much about money. Uh, people are doing experiments without proper funding for it because they need to be done. Uh, industry is collaborating with academia without the usual bureaucratic and IP-driven uh, barriers. Uh, and I think just the nature of the crisis has led to collaboration overcoming a lot of those, those potential problems. Thank you. Nick, uh, Mark, who's in the UK, says, and this is shifting the focus more from information onto spread and patients, do asymptomatic carriers shed live virus indefinitely or does their immune system kill it off quickly? Do we know? So there's two parts to that question. One is, do individuals without symptoms or with minimal symptoms shed virus at all and are they infectious? That's part one. The second part is how long does viral shedding last in either those individuals or other individuals? The, the answer to the first part is absolutely critical. Um, so um, it, it, there's actually very good evidence that some patients do get SARS-CoV-2, don't have symptoms and can shed infectious virus. And that's probably contributed a significant number of transmissions of COVID-19 around the world. 
and it's one of the major reasons it's been so difficult to control the pandemic compared, for example, with the previous SARS pandemic, which was effectively controlled. So it's really important and does happen. Um, in terms of how long, um, interestingly for this virus, maximal shedding of infectious virus occurs right at the start of symptomatic illness and it then tends to decline from then. So long-term shedding is not currently considered a major problem but it's also fair to say it is fairly early days and there may be some individuals who continue to shed live virus for longer periods and that could become significant in the future. And Ken, similarly, Emily Gardner who's in Darwin uh, she says, what's the current understanding on immunity following infection? Are there verified cases of reinfection, as we've seen reported in the media? Or do you think, as I've personally speculated, that the tests might be missing some pickup occasionally? So we test someone positive, test someone negative, because the test misses their positive, and then they miraculously appear positive again later, just because the test has worked that time. I mean, that, that's an absolutely critical question, both for planning our response in terms of social isolation and herd immunity strategies or, or vaccination strategies. And it's it's open at the moment. We do know that people develop antibodies against this virus. We do know that, it, at least in some contexts, in experimental settings, they can neutralize the virus. What we don't know is how long that immunity lasts uh, and how common reinfection will be and, and the nature of that reinfection. That's purely because this is the early phases of the pandemic. There are a lot of studies that will answer those questions in coming weeks. But our experience from previous coronaviruses is that immunity does occur, but does wane. Uh, how quickly it will wane with this particular virus, we don't know. Nick, uh, Nigel Dyer, who's in the UK and an alumnus of Pembroke, says, should we be looking at reducing the lockdown at different rates for different age groups and health conditions? I think there's a number of things tied up in that. Obviously, there's the immunity question that Ken was just talking about. And then there's the whole question of who is selectively vulnerable or more likely to have a problem with this compared to another group of people, isn't there? So what can you tell us about different people at different risks of the disease? So, so, so there's, as you say, there's, there's, there's loads of aspects to this. So um, one reason for a, a complete lockdown is to try and suppress infection across the board for everyone. In fact, that's the primary reason of this kind of lockdown we have in place at the moment. It's possible to imagine scenarios in which patients at lower risk, age being a major risk factor, so patients at lower risk under the age of, say, 30, may be allowed back to work at an earlier stage, realising that they're less vulnerable to the effects of COVID-19 than older patients or other patients with risk factors for severe disease. I personally think it's quite likely that some sort of similar approach will be taken, but it's certainly not without its problems. For example, even amongst young patients, although they're much less likely to develop severe COVID-19, some patients do nonetheless do that, and there have been deaths in very long, young, young patients as well. So th there's a huge range of factors that need to be put into that balance. You don't think that there's a risk that we'll end up with a treatment that's worse than, than the disease? So there is definitely that risk, there's no doubt. And so um, when talking about things like when to end the lockdown, um, there are some scientific um, bits of evidence that go into this. So, for example, predictions about what the likely effects are on the transmission of the virus subsequent to concluding the lockdown. But there are also political decisions as well, which involve balancing things like the effect on the economy. We know that poverty is associated with mortality and morbidity. So balancing things like the effects on the economy and the more immediate effect on loss of life. So there are scientific and political elements to those decisions. Ken, Rosemary Keatley is originally from Clare College. She's in Ghana. She's asking about something that's been in the headlines a lot in recent days. She's saying, what could account for the apparently poorer outcomes among non-white populations? She points to the UK, but this has been mirrored in many other countries, hasn't it? Yes, it has. It's an important issue. As this pandemic evolves, there are some things that we're very clear about. So we know that males are at higher risk of getting severe disease. We know that as you get older, you're at higher risk of getting disease. Um, and 
we there's some evidence that different ethnic groups may be at higher risk. I think the evidence for that isn't as clear cut yet. It will obviously become more clear cut as we proceed. And it's an important issue. It, with a, a range of inflammatory and infectious diseases, there are ethnic differences in susceptibility. Uh, there are many potential causes of that. Um, but that's something that is really has to be top, one of the major things on our research agenda is to see if that is a real problem. And if so, why and what can we do about it? Thank you. Now, Nick, uh, Sarah from originally Trinity in the UK at the moment says, what line of the potential treatments under investigation so far represent our best hope in combating the virus? Perhaps you could outline what the various avenues are that are being explored. And then, Ken, perhaps you could speculate on which of them you think is most likely to bear fruit. Fine. So, um, so, so, so essentially, there's two general classes of treatment that are being considered. The first is the class of treatment aimed at suppressing replication of the virus. And the second class of treatment is aimed at combating the immune response itself. The thing that the, the reason this is the case is, as Ken alluded to, um, there are two things going on here, potentially. One is lots of viral replication causing disease. But the second thing is it may actually be that over exuberance of the immune response is causing severe disease later in infection. So um, there are a number of antiviral treatments that are being tried. These range from licensed drugs such as the um, historical malaria treatment chloroquine or its cousin hydroxychloroquine through to more novel experimental treatments of which remdesivir is the one um, which is um, probably most um, furthest advanced. On the, in terms of then suppressing the immune system, the range of treatment spans, again, old, older treatments such as steroids, which are rather non-specific ways to dampen the immune response and, and ha may have considerable downsides. And, and then again, um, more uh, novel treatments, uh, one in particular called tocilizumab, an antagonist of one of the immune hormones called IL-6, um, which is also um, featured prominently in clinical trials. So that, that's the range of possibilities. Um, I, I guess, as you say, Ken can perhaps comment on what, what he thinks the, the most likely um, ones are to be successful. OK, well, I, I get to speculate. I think I suppose that there's, there's two approaches to this. The quick approach is can we find a currently available antiviral or a currently available anti-inflammatory drug that have been made for a different purpose? Can we repurpose those drugs to treat COVID-19? Uh, that will give us a quick result. Um, and, and whether it works or not remains to be seen, but there are promising leads both in terms of antiviral drugs and in terms of anti-inflammatory drugs that will be followed up in the coming weeks. What will take a lot longer is if we have to design completely new approaches to either the virus or to the inflammatory response to fight this, and then we're looking at, at months to years, or actually almost certainly years. So the current great hope is that we can find currently available drugs and repurpose them to use in, in the context of COVID-19. And I'm moderately optimistic that that will be at least partially effective. Thank you, Ken. Nick, Dan, who is in the UK from St. John's College, goes on to say there was a research paper from Oxford. Well, it's well, very, very doubtful if it's from Oxford, but, you know, didn't you train there uh, a couple of weeks ago suggesting the routine use of antipyretics, in other words, temperature lowering drugs, and especially paracetamol, that these might be unhelpful in treating the coronavirus because it reduces the body's natural immune response. Is there any evidence that suppressing fever results in longer term recovery and more risk of complications? Or is that fake news? What do you think, Nick? So, so I think um, so I wouldn't quite go as far as to say fake news, but I'd say that there's no good evidence to suggest that's the case currently. So um, what um, Dan might have um, been thinking of in particular was some reports a few weeks ago around the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that's things like ibuprofen and a possible association with um, development of pneumonia in patients with COVID-19. Uh, the situation currently is, as I say, no good evidence to suggest that's the case. And the advice is that where those drugs are required for another condition, they can be continued uh, certainly at least up to the point of developing the illness. Uh, Ken, Chris Thomas from the UK says, in past epidemics, and I think he's probably referring to flu pandemics, such as the Spanish flu in 1918, early treatments used serum from recovered individuals or animals. Is this being used now in the UK in serious cases? It's been reported in Germany and possibly the US. 
So, yes, it's quite right that so-called convalescent serum, which is, will contain antibodies against the virus from patients who've recovered, has been shown in other contexts to be effective. And there is preliminary evidence from a number of groups, uh, but small numbers of patients so far, that it can be effective, or might well be effective at least, in severe COVID-19. So that's an approach which is technically difficult to scale up and needs better studies to define how effective it really is, but it is promising. And there is the possibility that if that approach works, that monoclonal antibodies, or in other words, artificially made antibodies that target the same uh, aspects of the virus could be generated to provide a treatment in the longer term. So I think it is a promising lead and the anecdotal evidence is, is pretty convincing that it may well be doing something. Uh, Nick, uh, Ayan Sengupta, who is from originally Hughes Hall, is in India, and he's saying, keeping in mind the 1.3 billion population of India, do you think the decision of an early lockdown by the Indian government is the right thing to do? And then goes on to say, and perhaps you could answer this one, Ken, for a cure, is convalescent plasma therapy the only reasonable solution in the long term? You've sort of partially overlapped into that one, but there might be something to add to that. Nick, first. Yeah, so um, so I, I mentioned in, in my talk that so far Europe and North America, for epidemiological reasons, have, have actually been most severely affected. Um, but there are huge populations in um, India and the subcontinent, as well as in Africa and South America, who are potentially really vulnerable to this illness. Um, that's partly because really the mainstays of treatment here rely on health infrastructure so the ability to admit people to hospital provide them with oxygen provide them with ventilators on intensive care if necessary and these are resources which are not in so plentiful supply in india and are really not in such plentiful supply in many countries in africa so um so, so it's a big problem now so so is the idea of an early lockdown a good one in india I, i'd have to say on the face of it yes the problem is all it does, unfortunately, is buy time. So the question is, what comes next? And there is, unfortunately, no easy answer to that. And, and equally, Nick, the question of a lockdown in a country like Britain or an Australian city is quite different from a lockdown in a country like India, where people may live in very different circumstances and it may be completely impossible for them to socially distance themselves if they go indoors where they live with 10 other people. Yeah, so, so that's absolutely right, Chris. I, I completely agree. And so this um, refers back to the balance that has to be struck between the direct effects of SARS-CoV-2 infection and indirect effects, such as the ones that you um, describe. I, this is particularly acute in places, as you say, such as India or Africa. The, 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 what, the one thing that... Um, these parts of the world have in their favour is that populations are often a lot younger than in Europe and North America. And, and so that it's certainly the case that in um, Wuhan and Hubei province in China, um, the um, population of, of people acquiring um, SARS-CoV-2 were, were generally a lot younger than in countries like Italy or indeed the UK. And so the burden of severe disease was slightly different. So it's not all bad news but it is going to be a major challenge. Thank you. Uh, this is probably the last question we'll have time for. This one's landing in your lap, Ken. And uh, Mayank Goodar, who is from Downing, currently in the UK, says, looking beyond the next 12 to 18 months, what are the risks of an effective vaccine not being a viable prospect for this virus? And many people are saying this to me when I talk to vaccine experts around the world. They're saying, it's an ambitious target at best to go for a vaccine within 18 months, but that's assuming it's even possible at all. What do you think? Yeah, so, so it's, it's an important question. And, and of course, no one has the answer yet. It is assumed by some people that a virus will just happen. And I think that is absolutely not an assumption we can make. There are lots of viral infections that we have no effective vaccine for, um, HIV, dengue. Uh, and so there's no guarantee that it will be possible to make a virus, uh, make, a, make a virus, make a vaccine. Uh, in that time frame that is effective in the long term. Uh, it may be a lot more complex than people think. One of the good things, I think, is that many different groups are trying and they're using many different approaches to making a vaccine. So I think by spreading our bets across a range of different technologies, we're going to increase the possibility of, of getting a vaccine. But it's by no means guaranteed that it will be possible. Ken, thank you.
uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ken Smith and Nick Matheson, who uh, two very big brains leading the Cambridge charge against coronavirus. There were many, many more questions than we had time to fit. So what we've done is to put together a forum at the Naked Scientist website. If you go to nakedscientist.com slash COVID questions, you can register for that forum. And I'm answering, as well as many others who are helping me, as many of these and as fast as we possibly can. So you can register. You just click on register at the top right of the screen and you can put your questions in there and we'll try and answer them for you. This particular session has been recorded and it will be available on YouTube. We'll be circulating to your email a link which will take you so you can watch this, catch up again or review anything that perhaps you thought was interesting and you didn't quite catch the first time or you want to share with others. Thanks very much to, to you at home for joining us. Thanks again for your support for what you're doing for Cambridge University, both in terms of philanthropy and also things like donations of PPE. Do join us again in the future and do please uh, join me in giving a virtual thank you at a safe social distance to Nick Matheson and to Ken Smith. I'm off now to go and join Jeremy Vine on Radio 2, but enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a lovely weekend and we'll see you soon.